get help from Len Farrington, a J U of M entomologist that helped us collect some of these samples. And so um, Ryan's going to talk about the results and how they're compared to some data that we collected in 2002, and also some work that was collected by the GNR and some of the same sites. So um, I'll let Maria come and introduce herself and have us talk about what we did. All right, <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Mariah Rufer, and I work at RMB Environmental Laboratories up in Detroit Lakes. So we're actually about three hours north of here, um, pretty close to Fargo. Um, and we're an environmental lab that does water testing, um, zebra mussel, velger identification, natural vertebrate identification. So we've been working with um, Yvette and Kelly for a few years. And um, we just did this study was last summer. So. I'm going to start out by giving you a little background about what this monitoring is looking for and then um, go into the results and there will be some time for questions afterwards too. So. Um, so the typical water quality monitoring that people implement is water chemistry, so looking at phosphorus, dissolved oxygen, um, nitrates, different nutrients. But that is really just a snapshot of what's going on at that time, at that day. Um, and so you need to get a lot of data points and then average them over the summer to get a good idea. And this, this does give a good idea. Um, but the difference with aquatic invertebrates is that it's more, you could think of it as a video, it's more of a long-term look at the water body. Um, in this case, it's streams. Um, and these animals are adapted to live there, so they need the right habitat requirements. So it's also more of a look at the habitat quality and the water quality together. Um, a lot of times the phosphorus and the nitrogen and the dissolved oxygen is just looking at the water quality. So this is also looking at the habitat quality, the um, diversity of, of habitats in the stream, which can be little rock rapids and plant overhangs and logs and um, debris in the stream. Um, invertebrates, there's a long history of using them to monitor water quality. I'm going to explain a little bit about why. Um, and we use what's called an indicator concept for this. So organisms reflect the environment that they live in, and they're used to understand the response of that environment to changes. Um, and they can give an early warning to changes in the environment. And sedimentation can also be a big thing that they can uh, but this is where you're going from, I used just fish as an easy example. If you say you have a really nice, diverse fishery, and then with the input of all these stressors, all of a sudden you turn into one monoculture of a, you know, carp in this example that are the only things left there and that kind of take over. So that's an extreme example of going from the nice, diverse community to the um, dominance by the pollution tolerance. So a stressed ecosystem often shows that there's a reduction in the species richness, which is the amount of different um, organisms living there. You get the disappearance of the sensitive species, the ones that are really sensitive to pollution. And then you get the predominance of the pollution tolerant species like the carp and the um, blood worms, which I'm going to show you. So biomonitoring is a really sensitive tool to picking up the water quality and the habitat quality changes. And also in science, two explanations for something is better than one. So if you have your chemistry and your biological data and they're agreeing, then you have a really strong conclusion about the, um, what's going on in that stream. So um, how we use the aquatic in insects is that there's a very wide um, variety of tolerances to pollution in different types of insects. So we look at everything that's in there and we see if the pollution tolerant species are there or if the pollution intolerant species are there. So it's really important what kind of bugs are there um, and what kind of other. We look at other invertebrates too like crayfish and um, mussels and snails. Um, so that's how we use the data. And here's just an example. Um, something that's really intolerant to pollution is um, that first one on top. Do I have time? Okay, 
Um, the, the stone fly is the top left picture for you, and they need really clean, cold water with really high oxygen. Um, we did find stone flies at one of the sites that was um, towards the headwaters of uh, Minnehaha Creek, and there's a site kind of there, so fairly close up by Minnetonka. Um, also, caddis flies, um, a hydrotilid caddis fly, these are these tiny little caddis flies that have a silk case that they make for themselves. Um, we did find some of those too, and those are really, um, yeah, really sensitive species, you could say. On the other side are the very pollution tolerant species. So if you go to a site and all you find are, are snail, the left-handed snails, which means that if you're holding, if you're looking at the snail and the opening is on the left side of it, that means, um, that indicates that it's a um, pollution tolerant species. If it has an opening on the right side, um, it needs a little bit better water quality. It's kind of a nice, easy um, indicator. Um, Oligochaete worms are actually like little white angle worms that live in the water. And then blood worms um, is one name for them, but coronamid midges. Um, the reason they're actually red is because they can survive in really low oxygen environments. They actually have hemoglobin like we do, so they can store oxygen and use it. Not all insects can do that. Um, so that's one reason they're red. These emerge into little, those little flies that look like mosquitoes, but they don't bite and they have really fuzzy antennae. Um, these, these ones are the really big ones. Um, there's also little ones. But. Those are just some of the examples of what we looked at. <coughs> Um, and the reason we use insects, uh, in some ways it's easier than fish because they're everywhere um, and there's tons of them everywhere. Even in an impacted stream, you're going to find bugs or worms or something. It might only be one or two different species, but there's going to be something there. Um, but they're a major part of the bottom of the food web. So they're food for pretty much everything else that lives in the lake or the stream. So on to this actual study. Um, they did a study in 2003, and so we did it again in 2013, so it was nice. It was like a 10-year gap between the last study. Um, this study went a little further than the last one. Um, we, in 2003, the insects were identified to the family level. Um, this time we identified them to the genus level, so that's a little bit more specific, um, and even species level and things like leeches and snails. So what we did was compare it to the 2003 results, um, just family-wise, and then we calculated some new metrics um, that I'll explain what those are. Um, the Pollution Control Agency was really helpful in um, letting us use their Index of Biological Integrity Database calculator. Joel Cheerhart um, at the PCAI sent him all the data um, they have this really nice IBI calculator that they've developed for the whole state. And I think, I keep bugging him about it, but as someday it's going to be available for us to just use on our own, but right now you got to go through him. Uh, but it was really helpful, and so he fed it through that for us, and um, the PCA has kind of brand new this year, what's called Tiered Aquatic Life Uses Threshold. And I'm going to show you what that looks like, but um, it's basically how do you interpret the IBI? Um, and so those two things that the PCA helped us with were very, very valuable, I think, for interpreting the results. So just to show you the sites um, on Minnehaha Creek, there are quite a bit of sites. There were, um, well, there's 30 sites in name, but not every site was tested. I think most of them were. I think there were about 26 sites that were sampled. Um, the red sites are sites that the PCA has sampled in the past, so there was some data there from them as well. And then we also did the upper watershed streams, so Painters Creek, Clawson Creek, Long Lake Creek, Gleason Creek, Six Mile Creek, and then one site on Schutz Lake Creek. So a little bit more about an index of biological integrity. What it is is a scale of 0 to 100, um, and, and it takes into account all the different bugs that are found there, and then it gives an overall score for that site. So a score of you know, 100 would be in a perfect, pristine stream with all these sensitive species in it. 
kind of hero would be, you know, some mucky stagnant um, stream that has nothing in it. <laughs> so um, then the tiered aquatic life uses um, is something that um, develops a threshold of what what IBI do you want to see for these different uses for the stream? So exceptional use is um, more in the pristine levels of um, streams. Really none of the metro area streams are going to be even close to that exceptional use. Um, general use is kind of that, that basic um, use, but still, still pretty good for metro area. Um, modified use is streams that have been heavily urbanized or channelized, which um, probably applies to most of the ones here um, in this study. And I'll show you, some of them did meet this, some of the streams did not even meet the modified use. So, um, so we have to, um, there's two different types of stream sites, um, ones that have riffles, which is like a little bit of rapids and rocky, faster water, um, and then the glide pool streams. And so there's different thresholds for that, so that's why there's different graphs. It doesn't really mean a whole lot. But um, on this slide, you can see that the um, for the upper watershed streams, the modified use goal is an IBI of 30. And most of those sites are below that. Um, so when you're doing a restoration or some project in the future, a goal for that site would be to try and get that community up to that 30 level. Um, so two of the Six Mile Creek sites were, uh, well, one was above, and then one was kind of at it. Um, a few other of those Six Mile Creek sites are real close, so that one wouldn't need a much push to get up to that level. So Six Mile Creek kind of turned out as the best of the upper watershed streams in terms of habitat and water quality. Um, and then here's the rest of the upper watershed streams, just the ones that had riffles in the pool. So actually a couple more of those Six Mile Creek sites were right at that modified use goal. So those were pretty good for the area. Um, Schutz Creek was pretty good too. Um, I'll show you. Long Lake was a little bit lower, um, although the first site of the Long Lake Creek is actually a, like a stagnant backwaters of Minnetonka, so it's not real applicable, I think, to the, to the IBI. So for Minnehaha Creek, it was interesting. I, I plotted all the IBIs from the headwaters to the Mississippi River to see what the stream looks like that way. And if you look at that trend line, um, there's actually an, a, a significant statistical trend in the IBI from the headwaters at Minnetonka to the Mississippi River. So basically the community is good and then as you get through the urban areas it kind of declines and declines until you get to the bottom. Um, so the way these show on the modified use, um, again the upper watershed streams or the um, upstream part of Minnehaha um, is very close to that modified use. Some of the sites are above that. Um, some of the sites like one and four were really low. Um, and then here's just the ones with the pools, the glide pools that have a little bit different goal. But um, some of those sites, 25, 28, and 30, those first three sites there are pretty close to the Minnetonka end. And those had really good communities. They scored really high on here. And those were where we saw the stoneflies and um, those more sensitive. So if we were to go um, kind of stream by stream, what conclu uh, conclusions we saw. Um, we also took into account the impaired assessment from the PCA. So a lot of these streams are already listed as impaired by the PCA. Um, so Painter Creek is already listed as impaired for dissolved oxygen and E. coli. Um, and impairment for dissolved oxygen is really going to um, affect the biological community because they need decent levels of oxygen to survive in most of these areas. So Painter Creek scored the lowest of all the different streams in this study. Um, the IBI ranged from just 3 to 10 out of 100, so that's pretty low. Um, and it could be due to 
some channelization, some um, sedimentation where there's maybe just not as much habitat in the stream. Um, and then a few of the sites even smelled um, like hydrogen sulfide, which is, could indicate some waste treatment issues. Um, it was helpful to have Len Farrington be doing the field work because he could notice some of these things that other people might not because he's been doing it for so long. Um, he actually noticed sewage fungus growths on the um, downed woody debris on Site 8B, which is kind of up towards the um, top part of Painter Creek. So um, this one scored the lowest, and we recommended to test the um, the southern reach of Painter Creek is is listed as a territory E. coli, but I don't think the northern part is. So um, I think it just probably needed some data. So we just recommended that they do some E. coli testing to see if there. It could have just been a, it, it's hard with um, waste treatment because it could have been a one-time thing that spilled or overflowed or something and then maybe it's better now. So um, it's just something to look for. Gleason Creek um, was a pretty low gradient stream that running through wetlands. So um, as far as habitat, it's not going to be as varied with, um, you know, the perfect site would have rocks, um, rubble, and downed trees, and overhanging vegetation, um, trees so that there's shade. Um, so some of these sites that have been just modified or going through urban areas just aren't going to have that type of habitat. Um, so Gleason Creek, you know, wasn't as bad as Painter Creek, but still scored pretty low. There were just two sites on there. Um, Clawson Creek had a little more complex habitat. It had a little bit faster flow, so you get a little bit more diversity in insects down there. Um, they had some of those taxa that were intolerant to pollution. They had um, some mayflies that were um, could be used as clean water indicators, so we're getting a little better on this one. Uh, but I did talk to Yvette, and she said that the stream runs dry sometimes, so um, it it's possible that the reason the IBIs were low is because it's not a perennially running stream. And so when it runs dry, you're gonna lose those bugs, a lot of them too. So it might just not be as applicable to the IBIs that the PCA developed because it's a different type of a stream. Um, so it's probably better than it is scoring with the IBIs. Um, Long Lake Creek is impaired for dissolved oxygen and um, it's also impaired for the macrovertebrate and fish communities by the PCA. Um, I think they weren't doing exactly the same site. Um, a couple things to note, like I said, site one was the stagnant backwater of Minnetonka, so it's probably, it scored really low, but again, it's probably not applicable, applicable to the um, PCA's IBIs. Um, but the other sites, sites five and five A had freshwater sponges, which can be a um, indicator of some good water quality there. So um, this one, was kind of up and down depending on which site you were at. Um, Six Mile Creek scored the best of the upper watershed streams, um, and the PCA lists it as fully supporting for recreation. Um, and it sh a lot of the sites showed good diversity, and um, it would say poet diversity, which is Lycoptera, which is the stone flies I talked about that have the good. Dragonflies and damselflies. Um, the E stands for the mayflies, so there's some mayflies there. And then the T is for the caddisflies, um, which we found there too. So, um, and I, like I showed you on those graphs, a lot of the sites in Six Mile Creek met, um, a few of them met that general use goal, and a, a lot of them met that modified use goal. So they're right up there with where you want them to be. Um, a couple of the sites. 11A and 6 were just below that modified use goal, so that's a real good target to try and get up to that. So Six Mile Creek is in pretty good shape. Um, Schutz Creek, it scored really well. It had the highest diversity of all the sites in the whole study. They had the most different kind of bugs at this site. Um, 45 different types of species and, and genera at this site, so that's really good. Um, and the PCA does list this stream as fully supporting for aquatic life, um, and it had a forested habitat, so it, it has a nice habitat at this site. 
Minnehaha Creek is um, listed as impaired for macroinvertebrates, fish, dissolved oxygen, chloride, and bacteria. Um, it's also listed as non-supporting for aquatic life and aquatic recreation by the PCA. Um, the fair, like I said, the headwaters had a pretty good um, aquatic insect community. Um, first five of six sites met that modified use goal, so up there it's looking pretty good. Um, like I said, site 26 had stoneflies, um, which are the good water quality indicators. I think that's a nice orange shade of color, so 26. Um, downstream it becomes more urbanized and the bi biological community reflects that. Um, we did, um, I, I forgot what site, I can look it up, but we did find zebra mussels at a couple of the Minnetonka sites too, um, which isn't a surprise anymore, but <laughs> um, they are a macroinvertebrate. Um, but, and then and like I showed you, there is a significant declining trend in IBI from the headwaters to the Mississippi River. Sites one and four had the lowest taxon richness of all the different sites, which meant that that's the least amount of diversity in the different bugs we found at those sites. But um, they're closest to the Mississippi River. So overall, um, a lot of the streams are heavily impacted by urbanization, um, stream channelization, and this is expected for this area. Um, not a surprise to anyone in here, I'm sure. Um, Six Mile Creek showed the best biological community overall for the streams. Um, Minnehaha Creek looked good, you know, in the headwaters, like I said, um, worse downstream. Um, the 2013 data were very com comparable to the 2003 data, pretty much the same conclusions between the two studies. So that means over the past 10 years, those, these streams and sites haven't changed a lot, probably. They're probably about the same condition that they were about 10 years ago. Um, for the future, it is always good when you're monitoring, um, just because each year is different in you know, rain and flooding and temperature. Um, that last summer when we did this, the Minnehaha Creek was very high, um, which can also impact the number of species found. So it is really helpful to have more robust conclusions to have a second year of data um, for these studies just to get better agreement, and if it's a lower flowing season, you might get better results, um, unless the streams run dry, <laughs> of course. Um, so you could get another year of data on these sites in the next few years. Um, you could monitor the upper watershed streams at a different time than the Minnetonka streams. It wouldn't have to be the same year, but you want to monitor each stream, um, the stream itself in the same year. You don't want to take Six Mile Creek site one one year and Six Mile Creek site two the other year because then you'll have the different environmental factors going on. So. Then once you get a real good robust what we call before data set, you can do some projects, some stream restoration projects, habitat restoration projects, even just adding um, more buffer vegetation, adding wooden debris, um, structure, <laughs> boulders, that kind of thing to the streams and then give it a few years um, and then you test again as you're after and then you could see if you've moved up on the, on the goal there, make sure you can move up to that modified use goal. Sometimes it doesn't take a whole lot. I mean, you, the um, extreme version of restoration is you know, re-channelizing and wind, making more winding, but even just getting more structure into the stream and more diversity of habitat in there and then buffer can really help. Um, are there any questions? It's a lot to take in. <laughs> any surprises that some of you guys? Well, I was wondering, um, will any parameters that are going to be used for IPCA or will it be more on the Yeah, um, I think uh, I have been in, in 
contact with him because they did look at it and mm -hmm. ran the IBIs for it. Um, he said that they don't, because I, I offered to submit it into their Upwork database and they said that they don't put microvisit data in there. Um, so I could talk to them more and see if they would use it or not. Um, a lot of the sites had already been assessed, but some of them hadn't. So. Yeah, um, you go out with a net that has a long um, handle on it and kind of a D shape at the end of it and a real fine mesh. And you basically just walk in the stream and kick stuff up and then scoop um, a certain amount of scoops in each different habitat type. So you scoop under the um, overhanging vegetation, you scoop around rocks, um, you scoop around wood, and then you pour them all into a kind of through a, a sieve and then you dump all the critters into a bottle and you put alcohol in there to preserve them. And then, um, so Len Farrington from U of M did all that field collection and then sent them up to us for the laboratory identification. So we dump it out and look through and identify the bugs that are in there. So it's somewhat time intensive process. It took about a year for the whole study to Yeah, it can have a few different kinds of effects. Um, you know, it can cause, if it's a place where the stream banks aren't real firm, it could cause more erosion and then that sedimentation could um, cause those sensitive insects to not be there. Um, or if it's higher and it's flowing faster, you might have more oxygen, which means that they would be better there. So it's kind of a balance of, uh, you know, I think if they did a second year of studies, it wouldn't be you wouldn't get real different results. I think it would still be pretty close. Um, but yeah, the high water, it just depends on what the site looks like. If it's a, um, if it's a real site with real soft sediment and not a lot of habitat variety, you'd probably get away with less of your fee. But if it's a fast moving site with good buffer stream bank, um, firm stream bank, you might get a little bit better um, diversity. Yeah, between the other years. Um, so the 2003 data, um, they looked at the family level. And these bars are kind of hard to see on here. But um, the blue bars are the 2003. And um, this is a family biotic index. So it, um, it's like an IBI that I showed you before, but it's looking at just the family level. Um, so the green data is the, I'm sorry, the green data is the 2003 blue data is the 2013. So as you can see, most of the years are really close. Um, there's a few that were different, but I did note in the report um, reasons that they were probably different. Um, and then they didn't, in 2003, some of the sites, they, they didn't get enough organisms to do a full assessment of the site. Um, but we did, this time around, we did get enough, so um, that's why some of the sites don't have 2003 data. Um, they have 2013 data. Um, so these were the upper water sub mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all the same sites. So I don't know, I mean, the same procedures on paper, but um, they, they said if they didn't, get um, at least 100 organisms in the sample. They didn't process it, or they didn't do the conclusions because they didn't feel like it was statistically viable enough. But um, we subsampled to uh, 300 counts. We picked up 300 um, bugs from the sample and found 20 in all of them. So. <laughs> Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, uh, let's see. The In 2003, there weren't many specimens or attacks or found in Jason Creek. Um, but it was probably the, the, in the FBI in that year was probably artificially low just because they didn't find a lot of bugs there. Um, so the results from this time around are probably more applicable. Um, and in 2003, Flies were found both in 2003 and 2013. Um, the main difference was that there were some more missing caddis flies found in 2003 that were found in 2013. That's why that that family bio was moved up to forward. So the FBI is a more coarse resolution um, than what we did this time. So um, just one difference in a <coughs> type of bug found can make kind of a big difference on the scale. Whereas now, like if we were to compare this or last year's study to one next year, it would be a lot, they're both a lot finer um, resolution scales, though um, it would be close to the But overall, uh, and then this other map to the Minnehaha. Overall, it looks like the 2013 was a little bit <coughs> better, and I think a lot of that <coughs> was probably because um, there was just more specimens found. We had a better representative, better um, representation of the community that was there. Yeah, again, the, the two sites that differed by more than one. difference in site 13 can be explained by just the presence of tiger stripe or caddis flies in 2003 but not in 2013. So one taxa on this scale can make kind of a big difference. Um, the difference at site 30 can be explained by the dom dominance of amphipods, which are those little stud um, shrimp to go for a caddis fly. So, but overall, they found out with most of the organisms found between both the studies were the same at each study. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. It's not something you'd need to do every year, like your chemical testing, um, but to get, you know, probably two years of data every 10 years would be a good rule of thumb. And then if you were to do some restoration projects, you want to give it a couple of years for the communities to establish and then retest. So, yeah, probably doing each site twice in a 10 year period would be a good rule of thumb. You could do all the upper watersheds one year and then um, Minnehaha Creek one year and kind of alternate like that. So you wouldn't have to do them all in the same year. Because we're not, I, I kept all the comparisons um, separate between the different streams. I'm not comparing the middle Minnehaha stream to Creek Stream or other creeks to drive. Okay. Um, I know that Yeah, you know, it's, it's 
it's kind of good because I'm looking at this blind. I'm just looking at the data, so I'm not sure what the land use changes have been in this ten year period on each of those streams. Um, but I think that have they? Six miles. Look at the map. <coughs> Um, yeah, so, I mean, from what the data is saying, um, whatever change there didn't impact the biological community that much. Yeah. That's one good thing of me being blind to. It's nice to have a separate person doing the field work than that's doing the lab work because, um, I mean, there's no way to bias it because you identify what you see, but we talk then at the end to interpret the results, but it's nice to have someone separate from <coughs> the field work. And then, um, you, and then even another third party, which would be you guys, that, that knows the land use changes. <coughs> I have a question. I'm wondering if you looked at any of the individual metrics at all to try to figure out the trend of what metrics are missing. Um, a little bit. Um, we didn't do that. That could be done, though, um, because there are some species that are adapted to just eat wood and to just live in sponges. And um, we, there were some of those um, those organisms found in in those sites. So um, there could be a finer scale look at those specific factors for sure. And Yeah, I actually have the site notes here, and I think I sent those to you guys, right? Um, so these were done by Len Farrington, but he marked on here um, the setting, the stream width, the maximum depth sample, the type of the bottom, substrate compaction. He said yes or no if there's mud there, sand there, gravel, cobble, uh, boulder, submerged vegetation, velocity, he kind of gave a general slow model. That if there are ripples present or not, pools present or not, um, woody substrate, we have kind of a yes or no, um, rooted vegetation, undercut bank. Um, then he described the riparian setting. So if there were trees, understory, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, we have some pretty good notes. Um, some notes like lawn. One of those Painter Creek sites, you noted that there were carp congregating there. Right, they didn't do the protocol with it. Oh, um, not on this that I have okay. here. Just, and then you noted that there were sponges. Yeah, we could do that next time. Yeah, that might be something to consider. Yeah. Next time you're out there. That could be looked at still. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have the actual, if you wanted to compare it to the 2003, I, you know, we had the results report. I don't know if you have the raw data from 2003 or not. Oh, you know what, maybe I do. I don't think so. The actual each. There might have been smaller changes that have occurred in Fish Mile Creek, but we haven't hit the break point yet. Yep. We don't want to hit the break point. So yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. called shredders that eat the large leaf vegetation and stuff, those are usually found where there's you know, a lot of 
variety in the habitat and leaves falling in from the trees and everything, whereas the, you kind of know which ones are just in the shot that have had the sedimentation and just are explicitly seabase. So, um, yeah, each individual metric can take the time to help. So could do a lot with the data. <laughs> Thank you.